Good evening and welcome to another edition of Wednesday Night Refuel with Seven Locks Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Kyle and I'm delighted to have you join us tonight as we continue on uh, our, in our series of the names of Jesus. Tonight we're going to look at another passage or another name in which Jesus gave himself. Actually the most common nickname that he referred to of himself and that is the Son of Man. And as we explore the Son of Man and its uses, we're going to spend just a little bit of time in one portion of the book of Matthew this evening. But I want to point out to you that there he uses this throughout the Gospels. In fact, except with the exception of, I think, four times, the phrase or the name Son of Man is used almost exclusively in the New Testament in the four Gospels. So we're going to look at a few of those passages tonight from the book of Matthew. There are certainly more to explore in the book of Luke and in the book of John. And uh, if that is something of interest to you, uh, you're in luck because there is a very strong chance that we're going to revisit that in the coming year on Sunday mornings. So I invite you tonight to join me in prayer as we begin our time. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you for the ability to, to study more about his names and what they mean and how they impact our faith, how they shape how we approach him and how they change our lives. Lord, we love you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Son of Man, this is what Jesus often referred, how he referred to himself in the third person as the Son of Man. And he uses this in many ways to do several different things. First of all, the Son of Man is a term that is linked to the Messiah. It is who He is. It is, it is Jesus' identity. It is a passage that actually references back, or it is a name that references back to Daniel chapter 7, where uh, the prophet Daniel is writing and he has a vision of one like the Son of Man. And there is a certain quality to this Son of Man that, is, that he is a, a man like any other in this vision that Daniel sees. And there, so it's not by accident that as Jesus begins his ministry and he begins to teach that he uses the name the Son of Man. Because it identifies who his identity and is a statement to the world what his purpose is. Now, Tony Evans talks about this too, that the, that the name or the origin of this whole concept of the Son of Man also ties back to the virgin birth because it reminds us that Jesus is a human being. Now, He is a human being unlike any other. In fact, there is no other. He is complete and totally unique in His existence because He is both fully human and fully God at the same time. And His humanity is different from that of every other human that's ever walked this earth and ever will because His humanity is free of sin. In fact, the only time that that sin ever has any kind of interaction with Jesus is when He took the sin of all of humanity upon Himself on the cross. But the rest of his life, he is completely and totally unique. He is one of a kind because he never knew sin. But he came to pay the consequences of sin, to bridge the gap, as we've been talking about over the last few weeks, where humanity, when we chose to disobey God, which all of us do, we are born destined to make that decision because of the sin nature that is in every one of our hearts. That he came to pay the penalty for our rebellion and to make our relationship with God right again. Not because of something we have to do, but because of something Jesus did for us. And in order for that to happen, the one who is coming to pay the price, the one who is writing this, who is not simply the Son of Man, but is the Son of God, is God himself. A human broke that law, broke that relationship. Only a human being could repair it. 
Only a perfect, sinless human being could offer his life. And that is why Jesus was born as a human being, because you cannot kill a spirit. But you can kill a man. But this man wasn't simply killed. He laid down his life, as we talked about last week, for our sake. So he is born of a woman. Now, not in the same way that every other child has ever been born in that biological process. And Scripture makes that very clear. That the child that grew within Mary's womb was conceived by the Holy Spirit. There is no human male involved in it. Because what is growing within her is of the Holy Spirit. And it is Jesus, the Son of Man. The one born, not simply to die for us so that one day we could go to heaven, but as Tony Evans says, the Son of Man was born and lived among us to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth and to announce its dominion, its complete and total control. Its authority on this earth. So that is what Jesus comes to bring to us as the Son of Man. Now there's a couple different things that we're going to find as we walk through some of the passages in the book of Matthew concerning the Son of Man. And again, this is not an ex exhaustive uh, study of this. But I hope it will spark your curiosity to dive deeper into it. So turn with me in your copy of Scriptures, or if you use a Bible app, your favorite Bible app, uh, to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. And we're going to start talking a little bit about some of the realities of what it meant for Jesus to be the Son of Man and what He is conveying to us, what He's telling us as He uses that title. This is Matthew 8, verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw the crowd around Him, He gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father and then I'll follow you. But Jesus said, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. So, we, we have a tendency, when we read this little passage, to focus primarily on the last part of this, where the man is saying to Jesus that he will follow him wherever he goes, but first he needs to go and bury his father. He has a commitment to care for his father and make sure that his funeral arrangements are made and all is taken care of. The, the one interesting thing here that's not pointed out by the man in this passage is whether or not the father is still alive. Because it could, in fact, be a form of a cop-out or an excuse. And we tend to, like I said, when we, when we look at this passage from Matthew 8, we tend to focus on that first part. I mean, that last part. And the cost of following Jesus to the detriment of we miss something about the identity of Christ when he says the Son of Man. When he's talking to the, the first the student of the law who says, Teacher, I'll follow you wherever I go. And Jesus says, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We read that and we all, as, as I said, we have a tendency to focus on the second man who says, I'll follow you anywhere, just let me go bury my father. That we miss what Jesus is saying to the first man. Whom Jesus is trying to illustrate the, what it means to be a disciple, to follow after him. He says that foxes have a place of peace. Birds have a place of peace. Dens and nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Two things that we find out about Jesus as the Son of Man from that statement. The first being that the Son of Man... Jesus himself understands that his kingdom is not of this earth. We talked about that last week when Jesus was 
talking with Pontius Pilate when he said, My kingdom is not of this earth. Before, if it was, my followers would fight to free me. But my kingdom's not here. In the same way, the Son of Man, Jesus, understands that his life eternally is not about this earth. It is not based on what he can acquire here, what he can achieve. None of those things matter. What matters to him is the purpose that he's been given, which is to go and share the gospel, to be the gospel, to teach, to love, to serve, and to offer his life as a ransom for many. And so these other things are not a distraction to him. They're also, more importantly, not of supreme value. That is not to say that it's terrible to, have, to live in a house or have a car or anything of that nature. That's not what I'm saying, but what it should be emphasized here is that's not Jesus' main pursuit. These comforts, these things. And he's trying to tell this disciple, look, my way is not a way of prestige. It's not a way that people just stand up and clap for me all the time. In fact, I don't have any of those things. But I think it also describes very clearly that Jesus is saying the Son of Man, as he fulfills his mission, is going to suffer. There's going to be difficulties. He had a temporary home. He hung out with, at Peter's house in Capernaum. Peter and Andrew's house, most likely they shared it with their families. But he had no place of his own. And the transient nature, the, the fact that he moved from place to place to place as he had to to preach the gospel, to be the gospel, meant that he was going to go from place to place and experience different receptions. In his hometown, they ran him out. You know, there are many times that Jesus wore his welcome then. He, and ultimately, he suffered. And if to, to say that the Son of Man's path involves hardship, it involves trial. It doesn't stay there forever, but to accomplish the will of God means th is to meet resistance. And he fully understood that the message that he had to share, which is the complete and total truth, was going to meet resistance. Because as much as humanity wants to know God, and even the Jews wanted to know their Messiah, they wanted to know them on their own terms. The great blues musician, Albert King, has a song that I've been listening to this week. It's called, Everybody Wants to Go to Heaven, But Nobody Wants to Die. And that illustrates a little bit of the human nature and the, and the fact that we have a tendency, we want to talk about having the best or, or experiencing complete and total contentment in heaven, but we don't want, we don't want to acknowledge that the pathway to that is death because no one lives forever. Another funny part of the song, because it's, it's fairly ironic, the lyrics are, says everybody wants to hear the, the truth, but they want to tell a lie. You know, they, they, and it's, the song is about just pointing out a lot of the inconsistencies of our human existence. How we don't know what we want, we don't, we don't understand it. And a lot of times when we are confronted with what we need, we resist. And Jesus, that's the point Jesus is making, is I'm going to face resistance. And more than that, he's going to suffer supremely. You can come with me, but you got to know what you're, getting, what you're signing up for. Because again, Jesus tells the truth. He doesn't lie. He doesn't hold back. He doesn't obscure the facts or deny who he is and what he's about. The Son of Man is very clear about that. And to follow the Son of Man is to meet this resistance. Turn with me over to Matthew 9. Now, I'm going to start in verse 1. So as much as the Son of Man... knows he's going to meet resistance, Jesus knows who he is. And he's able to meet that resistance and to deal with it supremely by the grace of God because he is God, but also as the Father, depending on the Father for strength. Even though he is God, just as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he limits that and is dependent upon his Father. He's able to do that because he knows as the Son of Man, as he is born as the way humanity should have been and one day will be again, 
by the grace and work of the Holy Spirit, when we pass from this life into the next, he is really the one true human being, the way God created us to be, in fellowship and relationship with him apart from sin. He can face resistance on this earth because he has authority. He has the ability. As, as I said, he did not come simply to die for us so that we could go to heaven. He came to bring the kingdom of heaven here. And that means the Son of Man has the ability to alter reality. And this is how he chose to do it in Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 1 says that Jesus stepped into a boat. He crossed over and he came to his own town. And some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. Now when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain such evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take up your mat, and go home. The man got up and went home, and when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to man. Then this is if you've read the Gospels a few times, you, you might be more familiar with the account from Mark chapter two. It's usually the one if you grew up going to Sunday school or in Sunday morning Bible study, however you like to say that. You you heard this story a bunch. I know I did growing up in the eighties in a Baptist church. This was a big story. Friends bringing their, a group of friends bringing their paralyzed friend to Jesus. Mark chapter 2 goes into a little bit more detail about how they took a few of the tiles off the top of the house to let the man in through the roof because the house where Jesus was teaching was packed. But either way, however, whichever version of the story you like or whichever one you happen to be reading at the time, a couple of important things there. These men have brought their friend to Jesus and have laid him at their feet. And Jesus is amazed, which is why he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, why would he say that? Was it the fact that he knew that this paralyzed man, how he got paralyzed and he was doing something he shouldn't have? I mean, that's a possibility because I don't know if you know this, but the famous... The most commonly uttered words, last words by any male under the age of 30 are three. Hey, watch this. So it could have been that by some ill-conceived act of his own that he ended up in this spot. It could have been that he was born this way. But all we know is that he's paralyzed. He's got an issue. And Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. Could he be forgiving the man's sins of however he got in this shape? Maybe. Could he, been, could he have also been addressing a commonly held notion at the time that if you were paralyzed, it was because of the sin of your parents or your sin that caused God to do this to you? He could have been addressing that. He could have simply been complimenting the man's faith or all three. When he says, your sins are forgiven. Or fourth, he could have been proving a much larger point. Which is definitely a part of it, whichever other option you want to take. Your sins are forgiven. And at this, the, the teachers of the law in, that were in the house listening to Jesus began to, to be incensed. They were offended. Because he said, this man is blaspheming. In what way? Well, he is saying to this man, your sins are forgiven. And from their perspective, only God can forgive sins. And the way that sins were forgiven in that day were, was by an offering at the temple. They're not anywhere near the temple. 
There's no sheep, there's no priest, there's no one to go and all make an offering before God on behalf of the man so that his sins could be forgiven according to the temple system of that day. So it's blasphemous in their minds for Jesus to say your sins are forgiven. But Jesus knew this and that's why he looked at them and he said, wait a minute, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or get up, take up your mat and go home. And, but so that you might know that the Son of Man has the authority to do both. Hey, get up your mat, go home. And the man got up and was healed. Jesus has authority. The Son of Man has the authority to alter reality for good. And what does that authority look like? Well, he is the authority. He is the truth. If you want to know the, the fundamental aspects of who we are created to be, look no further than Jesus. The words that he say are, says and taught are true. They are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago, and they will be true 12,000 years from today. The Son of Man has the authority to speak the truth because he is the truth. The Son of Man has the ability to alter reality by speaking into this plane of existence the truth of God. In a place where it has been clouded and shrouded by the presence of evil, by the presence of sin, both in human hearts and present, and the spiritual forces of the heavenly realms that have claimed dominion over this place. Which is why as the Son of Man who comes to bring the authority of heaven to this earth, he begins to push back against the darkness by saying, I have the ability to wipe it out. And I'm going to start with this guy. Your sins are forgiven. I have the ability to speak, to, the authority to say that God wants to forgive sins. That's, part, that's very controversial. And honestly, even in... In the 21st century, as people of faith, that's hard for us to grasp that God wants to forgive us. Jesus wants to forgive us. And it's not once like he kind of wants to. He really wants to. He wants us to know that forgiveness and the life-altering presence of God's grace in our lives that changes and molds us. And the Son of Man has the authority to speak that. So he starts with the paralyzed guy. And when everybody got upset and said, oh, you're blaspheming. Oh, really? <clears throat> what, what's e what do you think is easier for me? In your mind, for me to, to simply say that the man's sins are forgiven, you have no idea if that really happens, right? Because they're just words. But so that you understand that those words actually mean something, get up, take up your mat, and go home. You can see that. You know that man's paralyzed. He's not anymore. Why? Because I said so. And the people marveled as Matthew said that God had given such authority to man. The interesting thing about Jesus though is that as the son of man he constantly points out the fact and I'd love to tell you that in the 21 centuries since the ministry of Christ the ministry of Jesus, of the Son of Man, that we had changed? Our nature? We haven't because in John 11, he points out the fact that people just really don't know what they want and that the Son of Man, this resistance we were talking about, that the Son of Man meets resistance. The Son of Man comes with authority and he challenges and defies the expectations of humanity. And he brings this up in a passage in Matthew 11 where he's dealing with John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in prison. He's spoken out against Herod's sons. Herod Antipas has taken his brother's wife. John has preached about this, or preached against it, and he's found himself in jail, and eventually he's going to lose his head over this, and he's heartbroken, and so he says to his cousin, through his followers, sends a message, are you the one that we were to, that is to come, or should we expect someone else? And Jesus tells John's followers, Go back and tell them, you know, the blind see, the lame walk, etc., etc. Blessed are those who do, who do not fall away 
out because of who I am, on account of me, or because I'm being the son of man in the way that God's called me to be. And after they leave with that message, he turns to the people and he says, what did you go out to the desert to see? A prophet? And he said, yes, I'll tell you the truth, you did one like that of Elijah. But I tell you that the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. And one now who is standing before you is the fulfillment of all things. Yet what's interesting is when you went out to see John, you saw him with the wild hair and the, cam and the camel skins and, and eating locusts and honey and you, and you heard what he had to say. You said, this man is crazy. And out of his mind. And then the Son of Man came. John fasted. He didn't eat. He ate bugs and honey. And you said, this guy is nuts. And then the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Like all of you. Normal. And you said, here is a glutton and a drunkard. He was a drunk. He said, and to what can I compare this generation? You're like the kids in the marketplace standing around going, what do we do today? Well, let's play wedding. They would have known how to do that back in the first century. They played that. Big events in kids' lives. No, I don't want to play wedding. Well, let's play funeral. I don't want to play that either. So the point that Jesus is making here is human beings don't know what they want. John came in one way to prepare the way for Jesus in a totally different and unorthodox approach and his long hair and the camel skins and eating bugs and honey and preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is near turn from your sin and be baptized to Jesus coming and not being separate out in the wilderness but being among them eating at their tables fellowshipping together and they said this guy is a drunk this guy is a glutton how could he be anything more than what he is they the Son of Man defies their expectations. Jesus is not who they expect him to be. He's actually something more. But that's a challenge. So what, what do we do with this? I think it, it's important to remember. As we look at Jesus as the Son of Man, what we learn is that he does not value the things we value. In fact, the things he values are truly greater and that he has a purpose to accomplish. And as much as he had a purpose to accomplish, he has a purpose for our lives. It is no accident that we exist. It is no accident that we have found our way to faith in him or we're on the outside looking in but are feeling compelled to know more about this Jesus if, if you're in that spot as opposed to to following Christ. It's no accident. He has a purpose for your life. And it's a challenge. But it brings about a good end because it's God's purpose and God's will. In the same way that there's a purpose, there's also authority. Now more than ever, we need truth. We need to know that, that when we come to Scripture that we find truth, that we find something that we can trust. In a time where the truth seems to be distorted and there seems to be two different versions, depending upon the day, Christ comes with authority to define and reshape reality. Reality in that where the kingdom of heaven is breaking in and changing and challenging the laws of this world, bringing grace, bringing mercy, bringing healing. And that's hard for folks who do not want to live under that. But the kingdom of heaven brings with it the authority to change your life. The authority to alter your perception of reality. Not in the sense that all of your circumstances change and your problems go away, but you do realize that the one whose faith, whom you have put your faith in, has the authority to make a difference. And more than that, to make you different, even if nothing else changes, you will. And also to remember that our expectation of who Jesus is 
will never be what he really or, or what we want him to be. And, and that's a good thing because he's something more. So much more. Because the Son of Man comes to accomplish a purpose. And we are blessed if we walk with him and we, under, we accept that. Even if we question, well, that's normal. But we trust in that. That he is who he, the Son of Man is who he says he needs to be. And it's important we know him. That he invites us into that relationship. So that our hearts and lives can be changed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll be back next week for week five of the Names of Jesus. If this has been a blessing to you, I encourage you to click the like button, drop a comment, say even just to say hi from wherever uh, you're watching this. Uh, but if you're on Facebook, if, if this has been a source of encouragement or a blessing or there's someone you know that needs to hear this, tag them. Uh, click the share button. Not because we want to make the name of Seven Locks Baptist Church great, but we want to make the name of Jesus great, and we want to touch the lives of others. So if this has touched your lives, I invite you to share the psalm and give God the opportunity to touch others as well. Uh, we'll also be live Sunday morning for our, our morning worship at 11 a.m. If you're local in our uh, Washington, D.C. area, or Montgomery County, Maryland, however you want to say that, uh, we also have in-person Bible study for all ages at 945 so we invite you to join us uh, for that as well. Uh, we also have a Spanish Bible study class in Zoom. If you would, uh, on Zoom, if you would like information about that, you can contact us at Church at gmail.com. Have a great week. I'm going to pray for you, and uh, we'll sign off for the evening. God, help us to understand more what it means that you're the Son of Man, that you've set us free. God, that you come to, to challenge what is valued and prized on this earth, that you have the authority to give us purpose, to, to give us grace, and that even though, God, it may not always look like we think it should, Lord, that it, you are something more than what we could ever expect you to be. Lord, we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Have a great night, and we will...